Hi, my name is Justin Gordon. Welcome to my talk, Webpacker. It just works, but how? So why listen to me? Well, I know a little bit about Webpack and React and Ruby on Rails and a bit about Webpacker. I've been working on this topic since 2014 when I wrote this article about how to integrate Webpack with Ruby on Rails. Then in 2015, I created this library, React on Rails. It's probably one of the um, most popular ways to integrate Ruby on Rails with React with server-side rendering. The library's got about 4.2 million downloads, maybe about 540,000 websites use it. And I've been working on my own consulting company, Shaka Code, since then, and we help a lot of companies out using, especially using React on Rails. So why did I create this talk? I was doing a project for my Shaka Code client pop menu, which has sites like this, restaurant websites. This is a React on Rails site. And we're setting up loadable components for code splitting and trying to make it work with the React Refresh Webpack plugin. So, and that gives you hot reloading. So you got hot reloading, you got code splitting. We got this website. How hard could this be? Well, it turns out it's pretty darn hard. And so that got me digging really deep into Rails Webpacker and figuring out a lot of things about it. And I thought, wow, I could share all this with you. So what's the problem we're solving? What's the goal? I've read this great quote today. No joke, I literally read this today. When you understand the problem, what to do becomes obvious. Understanding comes from multiple perspectives. That's from a great um, source called Farnham Street. So here's what we're doing. We're trying to put Rails plus Webpack together and we're trying to make it just work. So what does it mean by that? Works for who? So first of all, it's gotta work for the end users of web applications. We really need great performance for, because slow websites, basically people, you know, they leave slow websites, they suck. So it works for developers. We want it easy to write and maintain the code. And it's got to work for the Rails Webpacker maintainers because this not only helps those contributing, but it also serves as documentation for those using the library. So what are the main parts of It Just Works? So first of all, we want minimal to zero configuration needed of Webpack. So I'll make it easy for um, Rails developers. We want the Rails view helpers support fingerprinting and bundle splitting. We've got something called the Webpack Dev Server, and we want to make that easy to run. Um, Webpack compilation, we want to make sure it happens when it's necessary. And we also want to make it easy to um, set up your project for production deployment. So Rails has long had asset preparation with Rails sprockets, but with Rails 6, had this nice little release note. Webpacker is now the default JavaScript bundler for Rails through the new app JavaScript directory. So we're gonna create Rails Webpacker. What are the main parts to Rails Webpacker? The two main parts are gonna be orchestrating Webpack to create the manifest JSON and also the static assets, the JS, the CSS files, etc. We're also gonna to have to provide view helpers so that the views can display the script and the link tags so that the browser will know what files to download. So it doesn't sound too hard, but there are some main challenges. First of all, the Webpack output and the Rails view helper output are gonna vary by the Rails ENV. So the development environment's gonna optimize for the developer experience. The production environment is gonna be optimizing for the end user experience, for the browser experience. So the Webpack, another challenge is, is that we've got the Webpack dev server for the development um, time, and that's gonna be different than when we're actually creating assets statically over in the public directory. So when you're doing development, you can either have, your assets can be in the public directory or they could be coming from the Webpack dev server. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. And also, thirdly, you might also have the additional challenge as you're creating a separate bundle for server rendering, a separate webpack would we'll create some separate files for that. So what is the overall Rails webpacker flow? I'm gonna come back to this diagram many times throughout this talk. The main thing is, is that we've got to be able to orchestrate webpack. And so how are we gonna do that? Well, first of all, we're gonna have some settings in this config webpacker YAML file. 
Now, why did we put it in a YAML file? We put it in a YAML file because both Rails and the JavaScript code are gonna to need to access that. We're also gonna have some JavaScript files that are gonna set up our Webpack config. That's gonna go into the Rails Webpacker libraries and other Ruby code. It's gonna create this Webpack config object. It's gonna run Webpack. That's gonna create this manifest JSON, the static assets that's gonna go into Rails. And that's gonna create your HTML on your, um, on your, it's gonna create the HTML sent over to Rails. It's gonna have the right asset tags. And it's gonna also Rails is gonna be ready to serve those statically created assets. So let's do a demo of this. Give you a little quick demo of the end result. I created a sample application here on GitHub, Shaka Code Webpacker examples. I'm gonna start up Rails. I've cleared out my um, Webpack directory in public, so the files are not there. In order for to get Webpack to compile, Rails, that we're gonna actually go over to the application, hit refresh. Now notice Webpacker is compiling. So everything's up to date. Notice here we got some files were served. This is showing our network tab with the, um, what files were served. And if I go and I view the page source, I can see that this is the end result. This is what we wanted to show up on the HTML that was generated by Rails. We're linking over to the files created by Webpack. And that's what Rails Webpacker does. It orchestrated Webpack and it got us so that we got these files on our web page. So how do the new view helpers work? Well, I wanna put this in the context of our overall Rails Webpacker flow. Right now, we're focused at the bottom. We're focused on how Rails will deliver the HTML with the asset tags and how Rails is gonna deliver the assets for the web page. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So on our view, our index HTML ERB, we're gonna use the Rails Webpacker Helper style sheet packs with chunks tag. And it's gonna have a string in there that's home. Now that home corresponds to our file that's over in our packs directory. And that's what makes up for this entry point here, home. And so in the public development, public Webpack development manifest JSON, if you open up that file, which is produced by Webpack, it's gonna have an entry in their home. So if you were to take also a look in your config Webpack or YAML, it's got this public output path, Webpack development. And that's where the files get created by Webpack. So notice Webpack puts the files directly in the output directory that can be publicly served by Rails. So we've got the manifest JSON, and that's gonna feed into the view helpers. We've got the public output path from the YAML file that feeds into the view helpers, and that results in the HTML for the browser. And as I just showed you a second ago, that HTML of the browser shows you this Webpack development JS runtime home that corresponds right there to this manifest JSON, and that was produced by Webpack. And that's how it all ties together. Also, if you were to take a look at those different chunks, you could see what's in those. In the example that I've given you, where you can download it off of the GitHub site, what I did was I wanted to show split chunks working. And so what I did is I have some, one page that has moment.js and another page that has both Lodash and moment.js and another page that has neither of those. So what happens is that we end up with several different chunks. And that way, depending on what page you're viewing, we serve just the right chunks to the browser. In other words, it would be a complete waste if we sent all this JavaScript to the browser every time because somebody might never go to one of those pages. And our goal is only send the browser the JavaScript that's needed. This is actually one of the key differences with using sprockets because with Sprockets, Sprockets doesn't have this automated way of breaking stuff into chunks. 
based on how you've set up your application. So how does Webpack know to do the right thing? Well, now let's take a look at the um, top of the um, overall, the roadmap for Rails Webpacker. So how are we gonna orchestrate Webpacker? Excuse me, how are we gonna use Web, how is the Webpacker library gonna orchestrate Webpack so it's creating the right stuff, which will get fed into Rails? So this is how it works. We've got our Webpack configuration. As I mentioned, there are these different JavaScript files, and these JavaScript files correspond to your environments. Now, the only ones that actually correspond to the environments are the development JS, production JS, and the test JS files. This environment.js file, that's a common file that's imported, excuse me, required by the development and the production files. Also remember, this Webpacker YAML file of standard directories and other things is incredibly important also for the JavaScript side of the Webpack equation. On our client um, side files, we've got these entry points. I was showing you the home one. The home one's very simple. It's not including a bunch of the other stuff that's used by the example that's using Lodash and Moment, for example. We also have this package JSON. That's very important as well. The package JSON gives you access to lots and lots and lots of different modules, just like the Ruby gems. So what happens is, is that we take that Webpack configuration, we take all those files, all your JavaScript files, and it could also be images, et cetera, all those client-side files, all your package JSON, we're gonna shove that into Webpack and out of it, we're gonna get in your public Webpack location, defined in your Webpack or YAML, lots and lots and lots of files. And most importantly, we're gonna get this manifest file because the manifest file is gonna be able to tell Rails, hey, this file maps to this bundle, for example. So how did we get, so now how is Webpack gonna actually run? Well, when you install Rails Webpacker, Rails Webpacker installs a bin file, bin Webpack, and inside that bin file, it's gonna call the Webpack runner. So with the args that you pass into it, and this is the one for Webpack, there's another one for the Webpack dev server. And the main thing about this file that you need to know is that it's gonna load up the appropriate Webpack config. Notice, config Webpack and your node env. Notice not your Rails env. You can configure your node env, and that gives you the flexibility to configure only what's gonna be produced by Webpack and your JavaScript files. So again, what, what does this mean? Config Webpack, like say for development, that would be development.js. As I mentioned a second ago, you've got something like in, this in your development directory, your development.js file. And again, this is the overall flow that's happening. All this stuff is being orchestrated to get those files ready for Rails. So for example, the production.js file, that contains anything that's specific to production. Inside that file, it references this environment.js file. As I mentioned, it's a common setup. The key thing is that this line here, line five, the end result of this file is the export of a plain JavaScript object which is the webpack config. And that exact webpack config, you can see documented over here on the webpack site, webpackjs.org um, configuration. Also note, in the environment.js file, that's where you put customizations that would apply to all your different environments. Next, let's go under the hood and take a deeper look at what's going on. Let's say we want to see what your Webpack configuration is so we could do some debugging. Well, let's go back over into my console. Let me quit the app, quit the Rails app. And I'm going to use, I'm going to run bin webpack dash dash debug. So when I run that, what's going to happen is that this opened up the debugger. Notice I changed the default setup 
a little bit. So rather than just exporting environment to Webpack config, what I'm doing is I'm setting it to a variable so that I can inspect it. So I could inspect it over here, but I think I'd rather inspect it in my console because it gives me a little more space. So Webpack configuration, dig in, and I can go look and see what's in here. Like, look, the file name, this is what's file name is going to be that. I can see my path there. Most importantly, I can see the public path. This is where we're telling Webpack to put this stuff. If I go look in the plugins, I can see that, hey, there's this environment plugin. Notably, there's also this mini CSS plugin. Um, keep in mind that this is a JavaScript object that contains other objects. It's not just a plain old, um, say, like JSON file. So it's not quite so easy to print in your console. So what's really awesome about it, being able to dig in and check out your Webpack config is now you can go over to webpackjs.org and I can go to the documentation directory and I can look up some of this documentation. Like, for example, here's like the entry points for now, if I, now, what's also interesting about Webpack is that, excuse me, the um, entry points is that the entry points here are configured by the packs directory. So you see these were all configured there. So again, we're tying something like the entry points here, the, tying the documentation here over to the actual object. The, and that's the object that's produced by, when we go back to our main diagram, that's produced by running Rails Webpacker. It takes all these files and creates this config object, which is going to run Webpack, which is going to send all, everything into Rails. So you may, maybe you've noticed that your package JSON doesn't contain Webpack or Babel. What plugins and what versions am I using? Hmm. Well, let's take a look at how your package JSON might look. And this is from the demo application that I've got up on GitHub. So Rails puts in a bunch of these things by default, puts in Rails Webpacker. And here are a couple things that I added for my project, just to show you off some big, large bundles from Lodash and Moment. And I put in the Webpack Bundle Analyzer. But where's Webpack? It's very strange. Or is it? Well. When you're including dependencies from node modules, it's a little bit like Ruby gems. They can include many other dependencies. So in order to figure out, we're going to really want to know what these dependencies are pulling in, especially for Rails Webpacker, because it's going to be specifying all the different plugins for Webpack. And also, it's going to be um, having the Webpack version. And that's very important. So in order to find what versions you've got, you got a couple options. The Probably the one that's the first place to go to, I would recommend, is go over to GitHub, go to the Rails Webpacker project, and make sure, though, that you browse the correct version number for, your, for whatever version of Webpacker you're using. Right now, Webpacker, as of this recording, is up to 5.1.1. So if you're on version 4, and then you go and you look at the file on master, and then you start looking at the documentation for, say, Babel at 7.9, or whatever, Node SAS at 4.13, et cetera, and it's totally different, well, you're going to be in a world of pain. I can't tell you how many times I've been through endless yak shaving, going, something should work. I swear I've, I'm doing the code just for the documentation, just the way the documentation says. And then finally, I realize that the version I've got doesn't correspond to the documentation I've got. So make sure that you've got the right tag. And so pick the tag. And then when you browse over to the package JSON for Rails Webpacker, you'll be able to see the correct versions. So another thing that you might do is you might also run NPM LS Webpack or any one of these other libraries and see which is the one um, included. So in our case, it's Webpack 442.1 which you can see at the bottom is 442.1 right there. So just by the way, here's another thing to watch out for. The Webpack docs, there's no place to see the older versions of the docs. So by the way, I actually did find an issue about that. So just um, 
it's just something to be aware of. The Webpack doesn't change that much from version to version, but just be careful there. Another thing is you might want to override one of those versions that you're pulling in from Webpack. How do you do that? Well, there's a thing called Yarn Resolutions. So you put in a Resolutions area and you might be able to say, hey, I really want Babel Core 7.9 or Babel Core version 8 or Babel Core version 25, whatever. Well, this is the way you do it. So your package JSON contains this Resolutions area. So here's a tip. You want to minimize your deviations from the standard Webpacker configurations, which is basically the very, very simple one, which pretty much has nothing in it. And I'm talking mostly about the JavaScript part. I'm not talking about the Webpacker YAML part. I'm talking about your JavaScript part, which would be your environment JS, which applies to all your files, or maybe um, your production JS, et cetera. As I mentioned over in the slides, going back a few, right here. So if you start putting in lots of stuff in this production JS file right there and environment JS, et cetera, then what's going to happen is that when you're going to, when you're going to be doing an update, you're going to have to really check all the documentation really, really carefully. So just by the way, that's actually, this is a sort of work that I've been um, helping out lots of companies over the number of years is just getting through all this stuff because a lot of companies need more customized configurations, but it's kind of a lot of work to keep things up to date. So because I'm doing the same exact thing for a lot of different companies, I'm pretty darn efficient at it. So here's another tip. How do you create separate bundles for client and server rendering using um, Rails Webpacker? And the answer is the Webpack multi-compiler. You can find a link to that in my um, notes, in my um, slides. And so what does that actually mean? What it means is that Webpack can export an array of configs, not just an object. Remember I told you that our output is supposed to be an object? Well, it turns out that you can actually have an array of configs. So in this example here, I'm saying merge this client environment to Webpack config. And so then it's going to basically create this client config, and that's there. And the server config is already just a standard JavaScript object. So there you go. So that's how you can set up two totally separate Webpack configuration objects. So you get a different client configuration and different, and di excuse me, so you get a different configuration used for your client bundle and for your server bundle. And it's extremely common that you're going to need to do that if you're server rendering. So here's another common question. Can you use view helpers without the Rails, pack, Rails Webpacker configuration of the Webpack config? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, this has been, this actually, this question here, and or actually um, I've been digging into Rails Webpacker because all the React on Rails customers that I deal with, we have custom Webpack configurations. And so what I've done is I figured out how to use the Rails Webpacker library so that I'm carefully pulling in stuff from the YAML file and other settings from the Rails Webpacker library, but I'm not pulling in the whole Webpack config. So absolutely it's possible. And the key tip is use a Rails Webpacker node package from your customized JavaScript to configure Webpacker, configure Webpack. Excuse me. So once again, this is the overall flow, and here's a little diagram of this, is we can replace this whole top part of the diagram with your own custom setup for Webpack. You're still going to get the same manifest JSON, JS, CSS, fonts, et cetera. Probably the most important thing you're going to do with your own custom setup for Webpack is you have to make sure it gets the manifest JSON right. Besides that, if you want to get hot reload, hot module reloading working right, you definitely are going to want to pay careful attention to using that node package library. So I wrote down here a few bullets of the tips. You can use the view helper, skip the webpack configuration, and just use that node package. Because you definitely are going to need parts of what's in config webpack or YAML. So next, what is the best way to run Rails for development? 
I gave you a little demo earlier on of what happens when you run Rails S. So when you run Rails S, and if you just, this is option one, run Rails S, don't run anything else, and just set compile to true. Well, let me tell you what happens. The web request arrives. You've changed some JavaScript, et cetera. Maybe you've synced up from GitHub. What happens is, is that Webpack compilation will be skipped if the compile option is false. Well, here we got it to true, or the Webpack dev server is running. As I mentioned, this is the case. You're not even running the Webpack dev server. Well, guess what? We're going to compute a cache key for all your assets. This is a bit time consuming. We have to read every single one of the files, all your JavaScript files, and compute a cache key, which is basically an MD5 and a bunch of other stuff. We're also going to read that save, saved cache key from the last Webpack compile. So warning, this is really slow if you have many files. So why is this so slow? Well, guess what? I did, um, in the example that I just showed you, it turns out that we don't actually compute that cache key once. I've got three calls to the Webpacker view helpers. And what happens is you notice, and you could do this in your own, um, your own little test setup, is that Webpacker prints its friendly um, informative message, hey, everything's up to date, nothing to do. Well, it wasn't quite nothing to do because Webpacker read every one of your client-side files and it computed the cache key, it computed a giant cache key from, from all that stuff. And it did it three times. This is the tiniest of tiny apps. I think the number of files in the app is less than the fingers on your hands. So the compile time went to 20, or the serving time on Rails went from 27 milliseconds when this is happening to if you set compile to false and maybe you're running, um, you're doing something else to compile your files, which I'll show you in a second, then it's only 13 milliseconds. Also notice that the allocations here um, is a huge number of Ruby allocations that had to be created. So again, bottom line, bottom line is, is that don't just turn compile on and skip doing something and skip one of the next few options. So this is option number two, run Webpack in watch mode. So what you do here is you run Rails S in one council and you run bin Webpack watch in another council, or you might have a proc file. You might run that with Foreman, or recently I've been using something called Overmind since it lets you um, easily connect to the Rails S for some de debugging stuff. But basically, just you're gonna run two processes and one's watch. Make sure you set compile to false because if you run watch with compile set to true, you're still gonna be doing all that work of computing those cache keys and doing the compilation. Well, you would probably figure that out pretty fast. So when the web, web requests arise, Rails skips calling Webpack compilation if you set the compile option to false, as I just mentioned. So this is fast and why Webpack's highly optimized for this scenario and Webpack will be regenerating the file, the, the bundles anytime you save. So option number three for running um, your Webpack stuff is to run Rails S in one terminal and run the Webpack dev server in another terminal. So what happens then is that the Webpack dev server will proactively compute your bundles, just like running watch. So when a web, and so here's the interesting thing, is that the Webpack dev server is actually a mini web server to serve your assets. But if you went and you looked at your source file for, your, um, for what comes out of your Rails, you go view source, you're gonna see inside there, there's nothing different when you're running the Webpack dev server. So this is again, a little part of the magic of how it just works for Rails Webpacker. So what happens is, is that, well, first of all, when the web requests arise, Rails is gonna skip the Webpack compilation, maybe set compile to false, but it's also um, Rails Webpacker is set up to detect the web, if the Webpack dev server is running by checking wherever you've configured it on localhost port 3035. So it actually does a little ping there. So then this is a really neat thing, is that rather than changing the view helpers to put different output on your Rails view when you're running the dev server, Rails Webpacker actually sets up a proxy to the Webpack dev server. 
So where is that set up? If you go look in the lib webpacker rail tie in the source code, it's right here. Um, there's a little initializer for webpack proxy and it sets up at middleware insert before and sets up the um, dev server proxy right there. And that's where it is. And here's where all this stuff is set up inside your YAML file. And so that ties into running the Webpack dev server. And it also ties into what Rails is going to do in terms of the proxying. So I think that's pretty neat. So my config development JS is really tiny. Where the heck did all these config values come from? You might be looking in here and um, let's say this is your small development JavaScript development JS file. So it just got a few lines. This is from the installer for Webpacker. Const environment, require environment, and const Webpack configuration is environment to Webpack config. Um, there are a couple extra lines here where I run the debugger, but basically this is it, environment to Webpack config. So you pulled this out, this thing right here we got from environment. Hmm, well, let's go see what's in there. Notice this is my local .environment file, same directory. So in that file, it's got a few lines in here. And in this file here, I've got maybe some plugins you're gonna put in here. Maybe you're gonna call split chunks, and then you're gonna export that. So again, very, very tiny. So what's special here is you call const environment equals require Rails Webpacker. So this, the um, node library for Rails Webpacker, remember, not the RubyGem library, but the node library for Rails Webpacker sets up all this, the default settings. And it's not just completely default default. These are the defaults for Rails Webpacker, but it is going to be per your specific environment, whether or not it's development or production, et cetera. And that's what's going to go in this variable. The final part of the Rails Webpacker magic that I want to talk about is getting your assets deployed. So normally before, you've probably already got something where you're already running rake assets pre-compile for deployment. Well, turns out that Rails Webpacker does this for you automatically. And here's the actual code that does this. If you were to go look in the Rails Webpacker source code, there's a compile.rake file. And inside there, it has this method here, def enhance assets precompile. And what it does is this basically um, enhances the assets precompile. Um, it adds a dependency to make sure that Yarn gets installed. And then it calls the Webpacker compile task, which that um, essentially orchestrates Webpack to build all the assets. So that is the magic there. Here's, by the way, here's the Webpacker rake task here where it will call Webpacker compile. Well, congratulations. You've just about made it to the end of my Rails Webpacker presentation. So I want to give you a real brief summary again of what this is all about. First of all, the main parts of the overall flow are, special, are first of all, the config Webpacker YAML file. That file is special because that contains values that are read by both the Ruby on Rails server and also the JavaScript code that configures this Webpack config object. And then you also are going to have a file per node environment, meaning development, test, and production. And that's a place where you can have further customize Webpack. Those things get put together with the Rails Webpacker library, and we create this config object. So there's a little bit of Ruby code as well that runs, runs all this, and that's the orchestration of Webpack. And so once again, remember, we're just creating this config object, we stuff it into Webpack, and boom, out we get the manifest JSON, and we get our other static assets, JavaScript, CSS, fonts, images, et cetera, everything your browser needs, except the Ruby on Rails code, of course, which your browser doesn't need. And then that goes into your Rails server, and Rails will know from that manifest exactly what sort of asset tags to put on the pages it sends back to the browser. And because Rails Webpacker configured Webpack so that it deployed the actual static assets directly to the public directory. That's how we got the assets for the web page ready to go. 
Congratulations, you've reached the end of the talk. Hopefully at this point, you really have a good understanding of how we can combine Rails and Webpack using the Rails Webpacker gem and node module so that we can orchestrate Webpack and give the Rails server exactly what it needs to give you the results that you want so that all your client-side assets are optimized for development, for production, et cetera. So I showed you how it works and hopefully that's gonna help you configure things a lot better and basically just not end up with a lot of yak shaving, right? It can't be that hard. Well, I think with all this stuff, it's pretty expected you're gonna have some yak shaving. So on this last slide, I've got some resources here in case you end up yak shaving Rails Webpacker, server-side rendering, maybe you're using React on Rails, but you want to get better web performance. So I've got a link on this last side to, there's a Slack workspace with an invite link. There's a forum where I try, if you have a good question, I try to answer questions there, try to put up content all the time. And I've got my email on this page as well, so feel free to reach out. This is my specialty kind of yak shaving webpack and putting it all together. Been doing this for a long time. So thank you again. Thank you so much for attending my talk. And um, by the way, if you do get the slides, there are some bonus slides, which I did not cover in the talk. So definitely stuff deep into the weeds of how the node module works and some other stuff like that. Um, quick thanks to JetBrains, Shock Codes customers, Clubhouse, et cetera. You can see all this stuff on the slides. So thanks again for attending my talk. And I really hope you don't end up with too much jack shaving on Rails Webpacker in the future. Thanks. Bye-bye.